It's 7.01, uh, my time and your time, so I guess we'll get started. Welcome to tonight's BC Wildlife Federation Conservation Webinar. Tonight we're honoured to have Dr. Scott Hinch presenting to us. The Conservation Webinar Series is built to give you evidence to advocate on behalf of fish, wildlife and habitat with your elected officials and to give you knowledge. Uh, tonight, a uh, similar format to our previous webinars, we'll have about a 45 minute presentation followed by 15 to 30 minutes of question and answer. Uh, during the uh, webinar, you can ask your questions through the uh, Q&A function, or if you're coming in from Facebook Live, you can add them into the chat, and we will collate all of the questions and then ask them to Dr. Hinch at the end of the presentation. Uh, if there are a number of similar questions, of course, we'll collate them and kind of get them across in one or two uh, questions. Uh, this is going to be a hot topic, of course, so keep in mind Dr. Hinch is a scientist and a researcher and an expert, but he's not a policy maker. So try to keep your questions within the realm of science and evidence, uh, as opposed to uh, policy and essentially how DFO uh, runs things. If you feel that your blood pressure is rising, please feel free to engage your MLA, MP, or the Minister of Fisheries, as opposed to um, asking uh, questions of Dr. Hinch that he can't answer. So I want to get that out of the way. That's the important stuff. Now I uh, do a quick brief introduction. Dr. Scott Hinch is a professor in fisheries conservation at UBC. He's an expert in the field of fish migrations, ecophysiology, and behavioral ecology, and is the Pacific leader of Canada's ocean tracking network. His current work links to telemetry tracking and physiological approaches to examine behavior and mortality of juveniles and adults during their coastal and riverine migrations, the effects of migration obstacles such as dams, high temperatures, and fisheries gear encounters on adult salmon, and the role that pathogens, disease, and climate change has on migrations. He works closely with fisheries managers so research results can be readily applied. With social science tests, he is investigating ways that science and knowledge can be more effectively mobilized by stakeholders and decision makers. He has received several accolades for his work. The MITAX Award for Exceptional Leadership is one of eight Canadians elected into the inaugural group as a fellow of the American Fisheries Society, the American Fisheries Award of Excellence in Fisheries Management, American Fisheries uh, Society Award in Fisheries Education, and uh, the American Fisheries Society Highest Science Honor, the Award of Excellence, and was just made a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So in terms of an expert, uh, we couldn't ask for anything more. Uh, Dr. Hinch even uh, works and does his research in BC, which is that much better. And as I'm sure everyone who's on here can attest, salmon and, and steelhead in BC are in a bad way. Uh, they need all the help they can possibly get. And this is one of those threads, one of those pieces of the puzzle that everyone needs to know about so that we can ensure that we're fishing sustainably and that we're taking care of fish. With that, Dr. Hinch, it's all yours. Thanks for your time tonight. Well, you're very welcome, Jesse, and, and thank you for inviting me to give this presentation and good evening to everyone. So here's a bit of my overview of my presentation uh, that I hope will take about 40 or 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to go into some background into gear encounter issues, broadly speaking. I'm going to review uh, some of the research of both field and lab studies that my group has done uh, that looks at delayed mortality in released salmon. Uh, it's going to involve looking at uh, a whole variety of sectors, angling, beach seining, gill netting, purse seining, uh, and both in freshwater and marine settings. Uh, I'm going to review ways that we've developed to predict delayed mortality or uh, release mortality. And I'll be reviewing the effects of rising temperatures on this phenomenon and ways that we can start to think about to reduce levels of delayed mortality. All right, so some background here. Now the um, bycatch or discards uh, or the capture and release of non-target species or sizes is a big issue as Jesse mentioned. You know, globally, uh, estimates of bycatch uh, in the past have mounted the 40% of the total commercial fish harvest. Now, in, in recent years, that number has been coming down somewhat, but it's still a, a significant issue. Now, we release fish for a variety of reasons. Because they're not the target species, 
because they're a species of conservation concern, because they're undesirable for some reason, maybe because of their size or their appearance. But in BC, bycatch salmon must be released alive. And we know that a third of recreational harvest of some species do in fact get released. And, and more than half of some commercial salmon net sets are non-target fish. So this means on the whole that large numbers of salmon are encountering fishers and gear, but are not retained. So the real question that I wanna look at is what happens to salmon if they're released from capture? So I'm gonna work through some of the basic physiological aspects of release from capture uh, to, uh, to help, under, help you understand uh, some of the processes involved when we're studying these phenomena. So one of the things to keep in mind with any time you're capturing or releasing a salmon is it's in all likelihood you put that fish through real strenuous exercise. And as this, this guy is doing in his picture, you can see he's, he's playing with this fish. The fish is burst swimming. And oftentimes these fish will exhibit maximum burst speeds for quite a while. And while that's happening, they're utilizing a different type of metabolism it's called anaerobiosis. Anaerobiosis uh, means that they are generating energy, but not using oxygen. Instead, they're developing an oxygen debt in their body tissues, and that oxygen debt is gonna to have to be repaid at some point, and they can't persist for long periods of time swimming like this. So this is a consideration uh, when it comes to thinking about uh, delayed mortality. Another issue to keep in mind is that when they're undergoing anaerobiosis, they're accumulating a particular type of metabolite called plasma lactate. Now we're all familiar with plasma lactate, whether you realize it or not. Every time you go for a jog and you start going a little faster and your legs start to hurt and it tells you you have to slow down, well, it's because your muscles are accumulating lactate and you need to metabolize that so that you can uh, run faster. Well, fish, uh, although they can metabolize lactate, they won't necessarily slow down. They keep accumulating this if they keep using anaerobiosis. And this can actually lead to a phenomenon known as acidosis uh, if these levels of lactate get high enough. This is a pretty busy figure that shows how much plasma lactate is typically accumulated in tissues associated with different types of fishing. This is some work we did a few years ago, and I'll just, I'll just work you through this. So we have plasma lactate on this axis, and on the bottom, we're just looking at measures, average measures across a whole series of different types of fisheries encounters, some that we did uh, in the lab experimentally, some that we did working in actual fisheries in freshwater or the marine environment. The reason I put this up isn't to pit one type of fishery against the other, but to tell you that, you know, uh, depending on the type of uh, the way that fish get captured, they may be accumulating a lot more lactate in their tissues than in other ways. I put this red line across here to, to tell you that there are levels of lactate that if they exceed these numbers for too long, uh, or for too, too, uh, uh, too much time uh, while this lactate is at these levels, they can have some significant consequences to their survival. Uh, and although uh, not all these fisheries, um, have, the data show that they're coming up to that red line, certainly there were individuals within each one of these bars that would have exceeded that. So this is something we have to keep in mind that this is an important metabolite uh, that if it gets to too high levels can create consequences for survival. Another interesting thing to keep in mind about um, uh, fish that are being uh, captured and released is that there's often an element of air exposure to them. Now the air exposure might occur because as in, in this picture on the left, people are happy they caught a fish and they wanna show it off and they wanna take a picture. Um, or uh, it could just be you're trying to get the fish out of your gear uh, and it, you have to do it in the air. And at some point you're gonna put the fish back in the water but you need them out of the water to help you get it out of the gear. Um, so there is an issue of air exposure. A similar issue uh, occurs when fish are in tight schools in nets. So on this right-hand image, this is a beach sand full of pink salmon. Um, the local oxygen conditions in this net go down really rapidly. And so the fish become hypoxic, which is a similar effect to putting them in the air. So both of these have a similar consequence metabolically in that you're starving the fish of oxygen. The issue is how much of this can they endure before there's a consequence uh, in terms of being released. If you link maximum exercise along with air exposure, you often push fish into a system where they can't maintain their equilibrium. And this is an example of this in a lab experiment that we did, uh, where we exhaustedly swam sockeye for three minutes and held them in the air for a minute, and then they're automatically upside down. And that remains 
that way for several minutes or longer. Now, this might not be a big deal in a lab experiment, but if this happens in the wild, that could make fish highly vulnerable to predation if you were to release them under these conditions. Again, something else we have to keep in mind. Another issue um, associated, a physiological issue associated with capture and release of any kind is injury. Uh, so when, you, when fish get into gear um, or and they're being handled by people, uh, there's mucus removal, there may be scale loss, uh, there may be wounding caused by the gear. Uh, in this case, here's some net marks on this fish. You can see scale loss on this one. You can see a, um, um, an eye puncture here, uh, a, a wound caused by a hook coming into the eye. There's lots of different ways fishes can get injured as associated with a variety of, of different capture techniques. And these also have potential consequences. One of the consequences is that you're often inviting a, a location for pathogens and disease to enter the body. And so where you have the loss of scales, you have an open wound, you have um, cuts or nicks on the body, then there's a chance that a higher rate of pathogens or disease, in particular fungal and bacteria infections, uh, can get involved. And this becomes a concern uh, when they get to the gills because then you can start having uh, uh, issues associated with, uh, with respiration if the, if the uh, pathogen does make its way to the gills associated with some sort of handling event. But it's particularly a problem with maturing fish because maturing salmon are shutting down their immune uh, functions and so they become particularly susceptible then to pathogens and disease. And this, we've all seen images of, or you've held or seen fish on spawning grounds where they look like little fuzzy chia pets. And the reason they look like this is because their immune functions have shut down. It's a natural part of their, of their hormone changes when they're spawning. Uh, and then they are easily to pick up uh, pathogens like in this case, fungus. Okay, so just over a decade ago, um, we, my lab got into the study of, of catch and release, and we were interested uh, in just seeing how, um, what the general effects were. We didn't really know much about the mechanisms or the processes involved. So one of the first studies we, uh, we got involved with was a collaboration with uh, some local angling groups and uh, some local indigenous people uh, catching uh, fish and beach chains. So we were uh, obtaining sockeye through angling in the Fraser River and beach saning in the Fraser River. Um, we inserted transmitters in them esophageally down the throats, and then we tracked them to spawning grounds. Uh, this is a map showing where the capture release locations were and the series of radio receivers uh, that were in place uh, through the lower Fraser, and in this case, the Thompson Rivers. So we didn't have a, lot, a large sample size, but again, it was one of the first times we really launched into this type of research. So we were comparing uh, the, the post-release survival of fish that were captured and tagged from beach seines and from angling events. And what we found, is what many people find early on uh, when you look at fish within a day after handling is that pretty good survivorship for the first 24 hours. And then over the next few days and several days, uh, survivorship from, uh, from capture from both uh, approaches uh, declined. And by the time we got fish to spawning grounds, we were down to just about 50% out of the beach sands and just under 40% uh, coming out of the angling events. And these, these weren't statistically different, but it was certainly uh, suggestive that there was quite a decline in survivorship. Now, we know that natural mortality is at play as well, and we have to try to think about what levels that might be at. And other work we've done suggested, depending on the environmental conditions in the river, that maybe 10 to 20% uh, is an appropriate level for natural mortality. But what that means is that the seining and angling approaches accounted for an additional 20 to 50% of the mortality that was unexplained. So we didn't know why this was happening. We didn't really make a lot of measurements on the fish uh, that would have helped us uh, uh, tease apart the, the factors. So we're, we still were left with the question, why is this happening? What are the factors causing this? And this really launched us into uh, a larger program to try to investigate uh, the mechanisms associated uh, with this sort of uh, handling uh, and release related mortality. So we got involved um, with uh, pink salmon fishery that was occurring with beach seines in the Fraser River. And here we were looking at imperiled coho salmon that get intercepted as bycatch in pink salmon beach seine fisheries. So here's a, a, a bag of pink salmon beach seine being pulled in. Um, and we worked with uh, uh, this group that uh, captured in 26 net sets over 13,000 pink salmon. Um, about 100 
of coho were in these nets. So it's a very small bycatch rate, but these are you know imperiled coho, and so it's important to get all of them out of the net and get them on their way to their spawning grounds. So we took this opportunity then to develop an approach to see if we could predict how well these fish would do. This is a picture of my, my former grad student, uh, Graham Rabi, and he uh, worked on developing this approach called RAMP, Reflex Action Mortality Predictors. And it's, it's a way of predicting uh, subsequent mortality from really some simple vitality metrics of the fish. We're really looking at reflex impairment of the fish. What do I mean by reflex impairment? Well, we had five reflexes uh, that we were studying. Uh, the tail grab, as the name suggests, means you're just holding the fish in the water, putting a little pressure on the tail to see if the fish resists when you grab the tail. The body flex is just holding the fish uh, with two hands slightly out of the water and seeing if it wants to twist in your hand. The head complex just means that the, uh, the opercula are moving, the, the fish is breathing. The vestibular ocular response is just uh, having the eyes of the fish track you. So if you have the fish look at you, and you move your hands in front of it, the, their eyes should track the movement of your hand. And then lastly, orientation. If you turn the fish upside down like Graham's doing here in the water, will it right itself? So these are really simple metrics that you can, you can uh, measure really quickly. Uh, they were, they were adopt, adapted from um, another study that was done on non-salmonid non in California, uh, but we've been using this a lot with our salmon research. Basically the score ranges from zero to one. Every metric gets a score of 0.2. Uh, a higher value means it's a more impaired fish, a low value means it's not an impaired fish. So pretty simple that way. What we learned uh, right away was that this reflex impairment, the ramp score, correlated quite nicely with the amount of time that the coho spent in the same net. So the lower the time in the net, the lower the ramp score, the higher the time in the net, the higher the ramp score. So, Similar to the study we just talked about with sockeye, we, uh, we did ramp assessments on these coho, we put transmitters into them, and then we tracked them using the similar sort of, of uh, uh, array uh, arrangement of these receivers. And here's some of the results we found. We were able to categorize the fish into three groups, uh, sort of immediate mortality, delayed mortality, and those that succeeded in their migration. So immediate meant that uh, shortly after coming out of our hands, they died. Delayed mortality meant we tagged them and they took off, and we, but we never saw them again. Uh, migration success was pretty obvious. They got to where they needed to be. Um, there's quite a, a strong relationship between uh, these categories and how much time they were in the net. So if, uh, if they were in the net for 17 minutes or so um, or more, then we found that they were all uh, expressing immediate mortality uh, shortly after we processed them. Delayed mortality occurred if they were in the net for eight minutes or longer, and they succeeded in their migration if they were in the net for just under seven minutes. The ramp scores reflected this quite nicely with a complete impairment score of one under 17 minutes, uh, impairment score of just under five uh, for delayed mortality of eight, and fish were succeeding in their migration if the ramp score was 0.3. And this is an important number. Because I'm going to come back to look at this again because this suggests that maybe uh, if fish are impaired at only this level, that we that might be a good way to know that they're likely to succeed in their migration when they're released. But in the big picture, time in the net was the was the big issue. Um, the longer they were in the net, the less well they did. And part of the reason uh, is because of the oxygen and asphyxiation issues in the net. Uh, where we're measuring levels of four milligrams per liter, which we know uh, is quite low. And that was probably leading to the impairment and the high ramp scores. Okay, I'm just gonna change gears just a little bit uh, and talk about te water temperature. Now, river temperatures are warming. I don't think this is a surprise to any of us. Uh, this is a figure just showing the yearly daily maximum temperature on this axis and on, on year on the bottom, it's looking over about 65 or 70 years. And this is from the Fraser River, the lower Fraser River. So you can see this general warming trend that we see in the Fraser. We see this in most main large river systems and smaller ones as well. In fact, we've had about a two degree average increase over the past 65 years. And the climate models uh, were really good at predicting the last couple of decades. So I suspect they're gonna be quite good at predicting the next couple of decades. So we are anticipating conservatively another one to one and a half degree warming in the future. 
So we started to incorporate water temperature as a factor in a lot of our experiments because we realized just how important it is and how it's getting higher and higher, which is going to have profound effects on fish. We all know that temperature plays a key role, but these high temperatures could play especially important roles. So we started to uh, initiate simulation, fishery simulation experiments in the lab. And basically what we're trying to do is exhaust fish, um, expose them to air and do this under different temperatures to see what the consequences would be. So what you're looking at is a picture of some of my grad students uh, bent over a tank, uh, basically scaring a fish to swim in a circle until they're exhausted. And so you're, they reach in, you, you just scare them, maybe touch their tail and off they go. And if you do this, we were doing this for about three minutes per fish. They usually be well exhausted before then. So you're making them maximally swim, burst swim as, as hard as they can until they can't swim any fast any longer. Then we would expose them to air for a minute. When you do that, this is the result. Uh, the fish uh, lose their equilibrium. Uh, they're not able to get off the bottom of the tank for a period of time. So if we just look at this phenomenon of equilibrium, and I should mention that before I forget, this research was done by my former master's student, Marika Gale. Um, but we look at uh, equilibrium loss on this axis and temperature on the bottom, you can see this increasing pattern that equilibrium loss occurs for a much longer period of time, the warmer the water temperatures are. So there's still equilibrium loss even at cool temperatures, but it's, it's not as long as it would be at these warmer temperatures. We pick these temperatures to reflect sort of the, the uh, sort of a typical cool temperature that they might be encountering in during their migration. Um, an average temperature they might be countering and a typical uh, current temperature that they're now getting much more frequently in the Fraser. And you can't tell that these are sockeye salmon that we're studying. We can overlay sort of 24 hour mortality values on this and we can then see a relationship as well with higher rates of mortality associated with longer amounts of equilibrium loss and, the, and associated with that was higher temperatures. So, Without disentangling all this, we can see that uh, very low mortality, um, despite being uh, having equilibrium loss at cool temperatures, but significantly higher mortality at these higher temperatures associated also with much longer equilibrium loss. And I caution everybody with lab studies like this not to rely on, on these, these mortality estimates as, as being gospel in terms of what you might expect to see in the river itself. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, there's going to be other issues associated with doing these studies in the lab. There's going to be lab handling effects and confinement effects. So we really, I really like to think of these numbers in a relative sense, more so than in an absolute sense. And I'll be bringing that issue up again uh, in a bit about another study that we did. But we have done quite a few studies in the field associated with river temperature. And this is probably one of the better ones that really drives home the consequences of handling and releasing fish when temperatures are warm. So this is a, a study that was led by a former postdoctoral fellow of mine, Eduardo Martins, uh, and he's, he compiled data over several years that we collected on tracking sockeye that came into the lower Fraser and en route to their uh, uh, natal grounds inland. Um, these fish were all um, captured in the lower Fraser with beach seines, and then they, which as benignly as we could, but there's always gonna be some uh, some component of handling effects with, with that net. And uh, then there's obviously the acts of putting in tags and, and letting the fish go. Uh, and so what you're gonna see here is a, a series of graphs, one for each of these four populations. Uh, and they all kind of show the same thing. So I'll just focus on the Quinell one here simply because that's where my cursor is, but you're gonna see uh, the main line here, which is the, is the, uh, the average line, average response, and survival rates typically go down as the water temperatures are going up. And this is what we found with every single population that we studied. Uh, there's certainly variability among the populations and some like this one, Choco, might be a somewhat more thermally tolerant uh, than the others. But the important take home is that when you get to temperatures that we're now experiencing quite frequently in river systems, including the Fraser, like 18, 19 and 20, you see really poor survivorship of fish that have been handled and released. In some cases, uh, you know, mortality of, uh, this is survival rate, so mortality of maybe 90% in some cases if you handle and release them under these high temperature events. So really the take home point here, again, without getting into specifics of mortality rates is that handling and releasing fish under high temperatures leads to poor survival. Okay, so um, 
one other freshwater study I, I'll talk about where we tried to incorporate not, not just the exercise and air exposure component, but also the injury component to try to reflect as, as much as possible uh, the, the effects of a real fishery, but done in a lab, was this work that uh, my PhD student, Amy Teffer did. Uh, this involved um, capturing fish um, in the lower Fraser with the help of the LFFA and, uh, um, and DFO, uh, their partners in this work. And we were looking at uh, the uh, early Stuart sockeye that came in um, in July, and we took uh, some of them to our lab. This was several years ago when there were some abundant early Stuart sockeye. There are not that many any longer. Um, however, uh, this work uh, was important because we we're able to identify a unique stock and have that one stock uh, brought to the lab for this experiment. Um, the sockeye were captured at the start of their four-week migration. They were held under natural thermal regime in the lab. We varied the temperature in the tanks uh, to match what they would be getting if they were uh, migrating in the river. Um, we entangled and released, we entangled them here in a gill net and then uh, helped release them. You can see some scarring on the fish. Uh, then we exposed them to a, a minute of air and then we monitored them uh, for the rest of the duration of their natural life in these tanks. This is my research facility at the Cultus Lake Lab where we did a lot of these experiments. So um, as with a lot of lab studies, uh, you, it's important to have control fish, but there's always going to be uh, effects um, on control fish because you move fish from the field to the lab, uh, there's confinement effects, as I've mentioned earlier, and you're, you are handling these fish to a small degree, even though they are controls. So it's not surprising then that you get some uh, levels of mortality uh, over the three to four week period, even in your control fish. So what's important is to consider how these uh, values differ from your treatment effects. A um, couple points here, uh, we've separated them by sex. Um, I don't do that in all the presentate, all the slides, but I did it in this one uh, just to make a point is that we've done uh, a lot of sex specific work in, in our group. And across the board where we have started to look at sex as an effect, we find that females tend to perish at um, at least twice, if not higher rates than males under stressful conditions. So given the similar sort of stressful conditions, we expect females to do much more poorly than males. And, and certainly that was, a, that was a case here uh, for the control fish, but it was also the case for our treatment fish. So the first treatment we imposed on these fish uh, was a very brief uh, uh, entanglement and release and air exposure. Uh, and it was a 20 second entanglement. What we found under those conditions is that after the three to four week holding period uh, that we saw about 70% of the females died and just over 40% of the males, a much longer entanglement period, in this case, 20 minutes uh, was also used. And not surprisingly, uh, with a longer entanglement period, we had even higher levels of mortality for both sexes. Now, again, I wanna stress that um, you know, you can look at the difference between control fish and these and entanglement treatments to try to come up with some uh, relative estimate of mortality caused by uh, the lab uh, trial. However, you I caution not to try to extrapolate these numbers to the field because there's a lot of laboratory effects that are present. But what's interesting is the relative differences. And from that, you can make this take home that the longer fish struggle in a net before getting out, the higher the delayed mortality. And, We've seen this in other net fisheries as well, not just gill net fisheries. Speaking of other fisheries, just turning our attention now uh, to some marine fisheries. And this is some work we've done in partnership with uh, several different uh, uh, fisheries organizations, uh, First Nations, stakeholders, other stakeholders, and DFO. And uh, this involved um, uh, looking at purse seine fisheries, and in particular, uh, just how similar in some respects they are to other fisheries in terms of what the fish physiologically experience. So just like in some of the other fisheries that I've talked about, here we have gear encounter issues. So there's going to be injury and hypoxia involved when there's fish banging themselves against the nets and uh, in high density. Um, they're struggling to become free, so they're exhaustively swimming. Uh, so there's that issue of anaerobiosis and oxygen debt they're building up in their tissues. Um, fish have to be sorted on board. So there's gonna be air exposure, potentially some injury as they're getting moved around. Uh, and also there's direct human handling. Uh, so there's more air exposure, potentially additional injury. And then eventually uh, the fish that are, are not wanted, that are bycatch have to be discarded. So they, they get put overboard or over through a chute. So we studied the, the effects of this uh, uh, 
two of my PhD students did, um, Matt Drenner and Katrina Cook in this picture, involved with a, a, a Persane fishery for coho in Juan de Fuca Strait. And so here we are tagging uh, over 200 coho. Uh, we did plasma sampling on them and we'd made ramp measurements just like we've done with the coho studies in freshwater. And you can see in this picture here, here's a picture of a coho with um, an acoustic transmitter tag attached on its back just behind the dorsal fin. Um, we don't put tags in down their throats in, uh, in ocean fish uh, unless we're certain they're not feeding any longer. And we couldn't be certain of that. So we attached the tag to the outside of the fish for this study. Okay, so here's the study area. Uh, in, in here's their map of BC, and then here we are in the southwest corner of BC, uh, down here in, in Juan de Fuca Strait. Um, the yellow dot is where our vessel was fishing and where we were capturing and releasing fish from. Uh, each of these red dots is an underwater acoustic listening station. So this is first introduction to acoustic telemetry. I've talked about radio telemetry in some earlier slides. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of these shortly, but these are uh, underwater seabed mounted receivers uh, in this situation, situated in an, an array or a curtain across Juan de Fuca Strait. And they also exist in other areas um, around uh, the south coast. And, and I'll show you a map of them in a moment where they extend further up north as well. And there's several different organizations involved in maintaining uh, these acoustic arrays including one I'm affiliated with the Ocean Tracking Network Canada. So fish were captured, um, they were sampled, they were tagged or released, and we knew from uh, DNA work that they would be heading in this direction. And so we're interested now in looking at uh, these fish as they complete this 50 kilometer migration, which they did in about two to four days. So we're looking uh, basically at survival to get to this point. Uh, and some of the factors associated with survival. So as I mentioned, we did collect uh, blood work and from that blood work, we can then assess lactate. So lactate is that metabolite that if it gets to too high of a level uh, can cause survival consequences. So here we have on this axis, lactate concentrations in the plasma. Uh, and then on this axis, our ramp scores. So that's our vitality metric score that we were making. So you see there's quite a relationship here. The, the higher the ramp score, that means the more impaired the fish, the more physiologically impaired it was, the higher the plasma lactate. So this makes perfect sense. Um, impairment is, is being driven by oxygen issues in the, in the tissues. It's also being uh, caused by uh, being exposed to air on board the, the boat. And so you'd expect to see a higher lactate levels with higher ramp scores. What does this mean for survivorship? So if we just take a look at the top column on this small little table here, we had really good survivorship, but the probability of survivorship was really high if their impairment was zero and they didn't have any physical injuries. I'm not going to be talking about lactate right now because lactate and, and impairment are correlated. Uh, but what we found is that survivorship was quite good if the fish were not uh, physiologically impaired. Uh, so therefore, they're, they're, they probably weren't dealing with any asphyxiation or oxygen concerns in their tissues. Survivorship remains somewhat high so long as impairment is low. Uh, however, once a survivorship starts to decline quite rapidly, rapidly when impairment starts to uh, get about 0.4 and they start seeing injuries on these fish. And by the time um, uh, we have high levels of impairment and some severe injuries, we're having quite low uh, levels of survivorship getting to that line. Again, supporting the notion of, of injuries and impairment can working together uh, at creating survival consequences. And it's sometimes really difficult to separate those uh, when you're trying to look at these consequences. So we have to often talk about them together. In another study we did, uh, somewhat similar, um, but in different location was this Persane capture and release work on chum salmon that we did on the North Coast. Again, with a somewhat different group of uh, partners uh, involved with this, but this was also work that was led by my PhD student, Katrina Cook. Um, we didn't track fish in this study. This is one of the few ones we haven't done that in simply because there weren't any um, underwater acoustic arrays in the vicinity that we could take advantage of. But what we did instead is uh, after the fish were captured uh, um, and, and sampled and released, um, we put them into net pens, uh, primarily to look at their physiology. 
Uh, although obviously you can also look at survivorship, but again, I caution you from uh, taking uh, using net pens as the sole way of assessing survivorship because um, we're protecting the fish from predators and from other other environmental issues. So um, they're not, it's not often the, the best way or certainly not the only way to assess survivorship, but it can be, this sort of approach can be used in partnership uh, with telemetry studies to, to generate some really uh, cool insights into what's causing uh, delayed mortality. And again, this is some work that my student Katrina led, Katrina Cook. So what did she do? Well, like with some of our other studies, uh, we measured reflex impairment on these fish. Here she is holding the fish just out of the water to make, to make one of the reflex measures. Uh, she took blood uh, and then did injury assessments on these fish. And that would include things like assessing wounding and scale loss and uh, the, the fraying of fins. And we were able then to come up with a score of, of, of injury. What she found, and I'll just, I'll just state this uh, um, categorically more so than showing you res, uh, uh, data on this, is that you know, great, greater injury occurred with longer time in the same net. And in particular, when the nets were really crowded with fish. And so under those conditions, we saw lots of scale and skin loss and so showing that here. We had uh, deeper wounds than if the, um, if the fish were uh, not held in the same nets very long and uh, quite severe fin damage, lots of tears to the fins, things that we didn't see when the nets were not crowded or when the nets, uh, when the nets were, were um, when the fish weren't in the nets for really long periods of time. In a quantitative sense, however, we we're able to get a really good idea of what's going on from this rather busy figure that I'll, I'll very slowly walk you through. So again, on this axis, we're looking at plasma lactate, that indicator of, of, of anaerobiosis and um, exhaustive exercise. On this axis, we have air exposure. Each one of those dots is a fish that came on the boat that we measured lactate in and measured their air exposure. We actually sampled over 200 fish, but we only took blood from about 50, and that's all you're really seeing here. Uh, what's important to note is that our control measures or your baseline measures of lactate are this gray bar here extending across the bottom of the figure. And then we've got confidence intervals uh, with the dots on either side. So this is sort of our baseline level. And when you start to see lactate levels get above that, then we know that uh, they're, they are certainly working much harder, much more strenuously exercising uh, than the fish that were our controls that were not exposed to air at all. You can see this general relationship that emerged. So the more air exposed, the more lactate was expressed. And the relationship is quite clear because when you have a fish out of water for long periods of time, it is anaerobically respiring. It might not be swimming, but it still has to produce energy to survive. And it, since it can't get oxygen out of the water, it has to build up an oxygen debt in its body tissues. And by doing that, it's building up plasma lactate as well. So it's a really good indicator of that process. When we look at ramp scores, we can put two lines on this figure. The highest probability of having a ramp of 0.6, which is a really high ramp score, remember it goes up to one, was when the fish were exposed to air between four and five minutes. The highest probability of having a ramp score greater than 0.8, which is extremely high, was when air exposure was seven or eight minutes. Now, why I put these on here is because you have to think back to all the ramp information that I provided earlier. And we know from other studies where we had ramp information and we have tagged fish and tracked fish, which we didn't in this study, we know that ramp of 0.6 indicated a high chance of death for fish. Ramp greater than eight was certain death. So that means that the fish that are out here are, were probably not gonna survive once they were released. And the fish that are in here had, an, had a chance of surviving when they're released, but not a great chance. However, if the, the fish captured and released down here with this level of air exposure and this plasma lactate levels had a much higher chance of success. And in fact, if we were looking at what sort of air exposure you might want, expect them to have a good chance of success with, probably anything less than two minutes where the, their lactate levels aren't all that different from the baseline. Certainly anything less than three minutes probably would have been fine, but anything less than two would have been what I might consider sort of the best practice if possible. 
for this type of fishery. Okay, um, we've recently embarked upon some new catch and release research, uh, and this involves angling in the marine environment. Uh, so getting away from some of our commercial uh, fisheries. And uh, this particular studies uh, involved ocean angling catch and release. And I'll, I'll be focusing initially on one we did on Chinook and, and another one on, on Coho. These are just started a, a year ago. So these are all very preliminary results uh, and they'll be con continuing for the next uh, three years. So here we're utilizing this large coastwide seabed acoustic receiver network that I mentioned in an earlier slide, but I thought I'd show you an updated version of where all these receivers are located. You're probably surprised to know or to realize that we've got acoustic receivers scattered throughout BC's coast and Puget Sound, maintained by a whole series of partner groups. Now, each one of these yellow dots is actually one of these units right here. This is um, um, a acoustic receiver, a little tiny thing in the middle. Um, a little, that's the black receiver right there. And then this is a large flotation collar that keeps it positioned upright. And so they get anchored. You can see the anchors here, they get anchored to the seabed. Uh, they hang above the seabed with a float, which is what this yellow thing does. Uh, and then they can communicate to uh, vessels using uh, an acoustic modem. Uh, and they, so they can remain out here for five to 10 years, depending on their battery life. And we can uh, download information from them based on um, um, fish that, uh, whose transmitters get picked up on these receivers. So they're recording individual IDs of uh, acoustic transmitters from the fish that are tagged. This slide of this picture of a, inside of a boat is just to remind me to tell you that we used uh, as best as possible sort of standard angling approaches and vessels and, 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 and the practices as part of this uh, research. So the work on Chinook uh, this past summer took place in the Discovery Island region on just under 180 adult Chinook. Um, here's the Discovery Island region, just to remind you where it is in this little box. So I'll blow that up here so you can see it in a larger way. So we have a series of acoustic uh, receiver arrays in this uh, region. Um, this was the region, uh, the blue circle is where we did our actual catch and release of fish. And we had genetic stock ID information from each one of our fish. So after the study was done, we knew uh, which direction the fish should be traveling given these were all adult fish. And so they should be heading at some point to their natal areas. And so we have some idea uh, on where they're going. So just some really brief methods uh, on this. Uh, so this work was led by uh, my PhD student, Steve Johnson. Here's, here's Steve over here um, processing one of the fish. Um, one of the experiments we did was to um, um, expose fish uh, to uh, different levels of air. So it depended on, on, um, on uh, particular fish. We would give them anywhere from zero to two minutes of air exposure. So we had some that were controls that had no air, others ranged up to two minutes. Like with all of our other studies, we assessed ramp on these fish, we assessed injury levels, we assessed bleeding. And then as the bottom picture shows, um, just like I showed you in earlier pictures, we uh, used an external mount and tagged uh, our fish and then released them. So I won't go into too many results because I said they're still quite early and preliminary, but we have some interesting initial findings. Um, our ramp measures of 0.3 occurred when fish were exposed to about one and a half minutes of air. Now, this is an important result because we know that ramp measures above that uh, can lead to uh, negative consequences for fish that get released. So this gives us an initial um, perspective on uh, what sort of air exposure might sort of be a maximal level that may be tolerated by these fish without having any a significant um, consequences to survival, although this is still preliminary and we're gonna be studying this a lot more this coming summer. We found that uh, bleeding occurred in about 22% uh, of the captured fish and eye injuries occurred in about 27% of our captured fish. And interestingly, uh, um, the majority of these eye injuries, you can see one here, actually this fish here, is, it's, it's a poor fish because this one had an injury from a previous capture and release and then we captured it again, or we captured it, it's second time it was captured and we gave it, unfortunately, an eye injury on its other eye. Um, so uh, it's uh, unfortunate that that happened, but uh, um, we found that in most cases when eye injuries occurred, they were occurring because of us using 
uh, larger hooks, the six aught and the seven aught. When we use the smaller hook sizes, we did not see uh, nearly as many of these eye injuries. And I'll, eye injury becomes an important factor, as we'll talk about in a moment. So these um, these uh, fish that uh, we tagged and released uh, uh, were heading in different directions. We focused, um, uh, at least in this slide, I'm focusing just on the dominant population or populations. Those are those uh, heading towards Qualicum and Puntledge rivers. Um, and so these fish would have had to have crossed one of these three acoustic arrays on their way home. Um, we found that the average migration rate uh, for fish in these, in these groups, in this particular group, was about uh, 2.4 kilometers per day, which equates to about 16 and a half days to reach that first acoustic array. Um, There's a lot of variability, uh, quite a range here in among these averages, however. But when we look at uh, survival rates, um, it's quite interesting because uh, we had a small group of fish that we considered really in perfect health and the, the one level of control. And these fish um, were fish that were not air exposed. They did not have any eye damage. They weren't bleeding. There was no evidence of wounds or sea lice scarring. They had minimal, if any, scale loss, uh, no real marks on them. So they're in perfect health. These perfect health fish all made it uh, to these lines. Only 11 of them, but still that's quite compelling. We also had another control group that we called good health. At least I'm calling good health. I don't think Steve called it that, but that's the easiest way to describe it. They were very similar to the perfect health ones, although these fish may have had a few more nicks and, and bruises on their bodies and maybe um, uh, some more evidence of scarring, um, past scarring uh, from, from older wounds. But nonetheless, um, almost all of these fish also made it to the first arrays. But what we found is that when we pooled all the air exposure fish together, that um, uh, although survivorship was fairly good, we still had only 82% of them making it to uh, these first arrays. But what was interesting, and we didn't necessarily expect, but fish that had eye damage, even lower survival rates, 72% of those fish getting to these first arrays. So in our take home point, again, it's preliminary because this is we're just starting this work, but what it suggests is that excessive handling of any kind, whether it be uh, uh, handling uh, because uh, on the board of the boat, because of uh, excessive air exposure, or uh, and, and they're getting injured as a result of the handling, excessive handling and injury, uh, for whatever reason, can increase rates of delayed mortality, which is things that we probably would have expected, but it, we're actually now able to quantify what some of these rates might be. And of course, this is going to be helpful for, for us to be able to make recommendations on how to improve things uh, in the future. We did a very similar study uh, this past year on coho. Uh, this study took place in Juan de Fuca Strait, uh, tagging about 120 adult coho. This was work led by my PhD student, Emma Cook. Uh, just like with the Chinook study, uh, genetic stock ID confirmed the direction fish would need to be traveling. And so here we can see a a tag attached to a coho, and here we are up fishing uh, uh, just off of um, Port Renfrew and Juan de Fuca Strait for these coho. And here's just one slide of some results, but I'll, I'll just direct you first to the map. And so all the fish were captured in and around where that red dot is located. And based on the DNA work that we had done, we knew that all these fish were having to head eastward and would have to cross the Juan de Fuca line. So just like the work with uh, the Persane coho study I talked about in, in some earlier slides, we are interested in just how well they're able to survive and travel to get to this first acoustic receiver array where we have really good detection efficiencies. But we found that the average travel rates uh, to go that 50 kilometers or so was about 13 kilometers per day. It's about 3.8 days. Again, quite a bit of variability among individuals. Um, in terms of air exposure, we, we uh, exposed fish ranging up from 30 to 180 seconds. We pooled them all for this simple um, metric and found about 47% survived uh, to get to that uh, first array if they were exposed to air within this range of air exposure. The non-air exposed fish had a much higher survival rates, about 85% uh, to get to this line. So get very similar results uh, conceptually to what we were finding with the Chinook study. Now, I just like to, be, as I'm slowly wrapping things up here, I just like to put a plug in for, to, for one of our partner groups that we're working with, the Sport Fishing Institute and their app. 
Uh, so we have the Fishing BC app that many of you probably know about and use. And uh, on it, you can link to what's called the UBC Catch Log Project. Um, and what that does is it, it obtains information from anglers on their experiences while fishing. So uh, the air exposure, the fight time, hook location, hook size, gear type, injuries, that sort of thing for fish that you're capturing. Last year, we collected almost 700 entries uh, from public anglers, and I thank all of you for contributing to that. And it's so important to have this type of information because it helps us to design our tagging experiments to be to ensure as realistic to make them as realistic as possible in terms of hook size, gear type, um, air exposure, fight time, all these things that we can experimentally evaluate. It's we need to know what are the realistic uh, measures for this from public anglers such as yourselves. So it's really important to get this sort of information. So hopefully uh, people, if you haven't been using it, you'll use this and we'll get uh, even additional data in the next couple of years. Okay, um, how do we apply this sort of catch and release science? Well, obviously um, how it gets applied in some cases is how um, you know, stakeholders and, and managers in particular may choose to use it. Uh, one way that it gets applied and has been is to be able to quantify levels of delayed mortality for different fisheries. And so we're able to provide information on FRIM, so fisheries related incidental mortality. And this is certainly the delayed mortality uh, information that we've gathered is a component of this fisheries related incidental mortality or FRIM. And so we're, this sort of science that we're able to provide directly to managers or those who, who are interested in obtaining it. We can also make recommendations to approve fishing practices. And again, we can make the recommendations, how well they get acted upon is largely out of my control, but uh, our science certainly speaks to some of these. Certainly uh, reducing time in nets, in other words, reducing, so which reduces the injury potential and escape potential from nets. So for example, using shorter beach seines, shorter gill nets helps reduce the time in nets. Recovering fish quicker from these nets, so getting them out of the nets quicker is going to help reduce injury. And from a purse seine perspective, certainly keeping the net looser if possible when it gets brought towards the boat, uh, we know uh, is a, a means of uh, reducing injury. Once fish get on board boats, um, they can, we can reduce injury and impairment uh, and the oxygen and oxy issues by sorting them as rapidly as possible. This might involve the use of shoots and other ways to get bycatch off of boats quickly. Uh, and also just trying to expose fish less to air. And this applies to all gear types. So whatever can be done to make speed up the process and have less time of fish exposed to air is a good thing. Avoid fishing during high temperatures. Now this is not necessarily a marine issue. This is a freshwater issue. Uh, and certainly we're seeing this becoming a real problem uh, um, in terms of um, uh, mortality associated with high temperatures in freshwater systems. And unfortunately, this is only a problem that's only gonna get worse as climate change warms rivers even further uh, in the summertime. And lastly, uh, just playing off some of our really recent work with uh, marine angling studies, you know, using smaller hooks to help reduce eye injuries and reducing air exposure as much as possible are things that we know are going to be important uh, to ensuring the sustainability of, of released fish and ensuring that they're able to uh, survive uh, to get to where they need to go, hopefully to their spawning grounds. One thing I didn't talk about, and I, I just didn't have any time to, but I think it's worth mentioning because I suspect there may be some questions about this, is, is studying recovery or resuscitation approaches. And, and certainly we have done quite a bit of research in this, in this area. Um, we have studied the use of revival boxes and fish bags as means of, uh, of places where fish might be able to be recovered after um, being captured and stressed by capture before they get released. Um, certainly the results we have are mixed as to the efficacy of these approaches. One thing that, we, that I do suggest we could do is you could use RAMP, and anybody can use RAMP, it's a very simple thing to do, to assess the need for fish to be put into recovery uh, techniques or recovery approaches. Uh, with particular sorts of RAMP levels, you might decide it's a really good idea or perhaps it's not a great idea depending on how um, uh, impaired the, the fish is physiologically. We've learned that some resuscitation approaches can actually make things worse uh, because it causes more handling. And so the, the one of the takeaways, I guess, from our work on recovery and resuscitation is if the salmon have modest impairment and no injury, they might benefit the most. However, if they have seriously injured or seriously impaired, uh, these, uh, these recovery or resuscitation approaches don't seem to help 
And in fact, they might make things worse. And lastly, um, you know, we also have been helping and using our science uh, to assist in developing guidance for best practices. And um, certainly our group uh, helped contribute to the guidance to derive uh, FRIM approaches in Pacific salmon. And we're really happy to provide our science to that. And this is an ongoing, docu on ongoing process for us. And we've also written some popular pieces uh, dealing with uh, anoxia and fish exposed to air and how much is too much for fish to, to cope with when they are being handled and released. And uh, I just like to thank so many people for contributing to our research, both in a funding sense and in a collaboration sense. Um, I hope I got your logo up here. Uh, numerous stakeholders, uh, environmental groups, foundations, First Nation groups, universities, uh, private companies. Uh, so many of you have, have worked closely with us and I thank all of you for your continued support. And in particular, uh, I thank all the members of my lab particularly those listed on the left. I won't read their names up, but I borrowed all your data and your results and I presented it here. And I thank you for collecting that information over the years and for all your hard work and, and the work that you're continuing to do. So thank you to all of you. And thanks to all of you for listening uh, to the seminar. I really appreciate your attention. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thanks, Jesse. Awesome, Dr. Hinch, that was, uh, that was great. Uh, we'll switch over to questions. Uh, we've got a few in the hopper already and uh, for folks who are on Facebook Live or on Zoom, you can feel free to put it in the Q&A and we'll ask them. So the first one actually came in before the presentation um, and it's, it's a bit leading, but we'll see if, you're, if there's any letter, if you're up on the let. So it says most, if not all the studies involving catch and release impacts looked at the survival of fish from a single encounter with angling capture. Fish are observed only for the immediate post-release period. If they swim away, the assumption is they contribute to the spawning populations. What evidence is there to support that caught and released fish are not caught again and again? And what evidence is there to support fish caught and released one or more times contribute to the overall reproductive performance of their population at the same rate they would as if they had never been caught? Wow. Well. <laughs> Whoever asked that question, you're welcome to come and do a PhD with me on that, because that's a huge, huge question and issue. And thanks for asking it. You're right um, that in almost all cases, the research we're doing, both in the lab and in the field, focuses on a single capture and release of event. We do know that fish get captured and released more than once. Um, and it's possible that they're captured in one type of gear and released and then captured again in a different type of gear and released. Um, we do not know what the consequences are of the multiple capture release events. Uh, my best guess is that uh, it's not good, <laughs> that it's probably not as, as simple as, uh, it, it wouldn't be simple math to figure out that it's uh, how much survival rates are declined when you capture a second time. It's probably not a simple additive thing. Uh, because it, and a lot's going to depend on how close to the last capture that second capture was. Have the fish formally recovered physiologically from that first capture event before it has to go through another recovery event with the second capture? If it's completely physiologically recovered and the second capture doesn't create any additional uh, new injuries in particular, um, certainly, we know uh, salmon can go through multiple exercise bouts, and we've certainly done that in the lab where we put fish uh, through maximal swimming tests. Uh, we then let them rest and we put them through the same test again. We let them rest and put it through them again. So we're pushing them to their maximum physiological capacity and they can recover uh, you know, within, uh, within a few hours and do it again. And of course, we know they have to do this in nature. They have to be able to maximally swim to get through rapids and, and waterfalls and other things to get to their spawning grounds. What, what's uncertain is the layering on of these, these additive problems like injury, uh, which doesn't go away. Uh, at least it doesn't go away quickly. So if a fish gets injured, uh, then I would guess that the second time it's captured, uh, it's more likely not to survive as well because that injury is leading uh, to potential pathogen disease concerns, uh, as well as uh, preventing, um, uh, um, uh, preventing full recovery physiologically of these fish. So it's, there's so much context to that question, uh, but the simple answer is we don't know. And it's really difficult to study. 
Uh, but certainly we are, we're seeing in our work right now with Chinook and Coho in the marine environment that uh, we are co coming across fish that are already had been already been captured. That one fish I gave you is a great example. It had a, an eye injury that was recovering from, I'm not sure how old that eye injury was, but certainly we gave it another eye injury. And I'm pretty sure that fish made it to the first acoustic line. Um, and many of our fish that get injured are making it to their spawning grounds. How often they're getting recaptured along the way, uh, we don't actually know, but we are getting information in from anglers and other groups that capture our fish and let them go. Uh, that, you know, at least we have some um, anecdotal information that when that happens, fish can still make it to spawning grounds. So long answer, but very complicated, complex question. Have you looked into the physiological changes under survivorship from electrofishing and any thoughts on what you'd expect for a response? Oh, I have not studied the physiological consequences of electrofishing, uh, nor do I know how well they would work on uh, on adult fish that we're talking about here. I've certainly used electrofishing on small fish in streams. Uh, and uh, and aware that you know as long as we they don't get used too often, the research suggests that it doesn't have any long term impacts. It has to be done properly with the right settings, uh, with the right water chemistry. Otherwise, you can harm the fish if we're talking about small stream fish. Um, and so I guess that's all I can tell you right now. I I have not studied uh, electro fishing. We have studied electro sedation. Uh, which is another approach that's used instead of chemicals for sedating fish. We don't use chemicals in much of the research we do. We, we don't use any anesthesia really uh, because things are happening so quickly uh, on our fish and we, we can't use anesthesia um, uh, because it, it might impair their ability to recover quickly in the field. Uh, but electrosedation is certainly used by a lot of my colleagues to uh, rapidly slow a fish down so you can take samples from it and tag it. We've tried electrosedation on adult fish, and it didn't seem to work as well as others claimed it did. Uh, we were trying this with um, with uh, sockeye at different locations along their migration route, and if anything, in our experience, it made them more excitable, and it, it didn't seem to do what we wanted them to do. So we quickly gave gave our electrosedation gloves away, and haven't used them since. Okay, thanks. Uh... A few questions around the Discovery Island data. The first one is, what what do you define as bleeding? Was it uh, any specific part or anywhere there was bleeding? I guess it's gill, mouth, body, et cetera. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, it, it was easily observed. Usually, I don't have a picture of this, but when you, because we, we brought the fish on board the boat really rapidly to be able to put the tag in and make a couple quick length and, and, and diameter measurements, you would rapidly see bleeding, uh, blood accumulating in our trough. Uh, where the blood was coming from, oftentimes from the eye, from the mouth, hopefully not from the gill, uh, but certainly in and around where the hook penetrated the fish. Great, uh, we'll, we'll kind of stick to this theme for the next few questions. Uh, in Steve Johnson's study, did you control for gear type employed to collect samples? Did you review literature that examines the effect of different gear types in sport fisheries, i.e. spoons versus flashers, bait, uh, hook size, all those sorts of things? Any insight on that? Yeah, um, so in the Discovery Island study, uh, primarily uh, using, I believe, plugs and, and flashers, uh, we used a variety of different uh, hook sizes ranging from um, Three aught to seven aught, um, and so and so we were and we were record then with the the particular sort of gear, uh, you know where the where the hook uh, entered the fish, um, whether there's bleeding associated with the hook, whether damage, uh, the where uh, the damage was located. What was really cool about um, 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 yeah, primarily plugs in and uh, hoochies. What was really cool about our results that Steve did is when we looked at our app data, we had really good concordance between what people uh, were reporting on from the on the, the app information with what we were using. So uh, in terms of realism, we were really close, we felt, uh, in that particular study. Um, you know, uh, similar in terms of hook location, we we're finding, you know, a lot of hooks being captured, uh, being in the corner of the mouth and, and the exterior of the maxilla. And again, very similar to what the public angles were telling us they were finding. So 
I'm feeling pretty comfortable that we were doing things that were as realistic as possible, but this is why it's so important to get more information from the public so that we can make sure we emulate that as much as possible in our work as we move forward. I hope Great. I hope answer the question. Yeah, no, that's, uh, there's another one around hook size. Actually, it seems to be a bit of a theme. Uh, talk about, you know, I think this is more anecdotal, but larger hooks seem to cause more eye injuries, but smaller hooks tend to go down the throat and into the gills and cause injury and significant bleeding. Are, are, you, sh are you seeing any of that or? Um, hmm. S certainly the bigger hooks, we saw the eye injuries. It was, it was quite clear. I'm just trying to find the actual numbers here. Um, with the eye injuries, it was, let's see. Um, 49% of the large hooks caused some level of injury uh, in relation to the small hooks, which was just a fraction of that. I think it was something like, I want to say 17% caused eye injury with the small hooks. I don't believe there was much hooking deep in the mouth. Most of the hooking occurred the corner of the mouth, the upper and lower portion of the mouth. Just a small fraction of our fish were, were deep hooked. Okay, great. Um, are you, maybe too early, do you have any, how do your preliminary survival results for Chinook angling compare to previous uh, DFO studies? <laughs> I'd say it's a little preliminary. Um, we're always very cautious with trying to use those DFO studies, particularly the ones that are focused on, on holding studies, uh, simply because they tend to be 24 to 48 hour uh, net pen studies. And so I'm, I'm always very cautious and conservative about contrasting survival results between theirs and what we're doing, simply because you're putting fish into a real protected environment um, great for making sure you can sample your fish repeatedly, which is why I like to use them for physiological studies. I don't, they're not as great just to estimate mortality, but they can be used to supplement mortality information. If anything, I would expect mortality to be in some cases, maybe even somewhat higher, uh, when they're confined into pens. And we see this in the lab too. When you can find them in tanks, uh, we often have higher mortality rates than when they're free to move in the field. So it could go either way. Uh, and so I'm always very cautious in trying to make direct comparisons between telemetry-based observations, particularly hours where fish are migrating for two weeks before they're being detected versus holding in pens for two to two days. So it's, it's really an apples and oranges comparison. Great. Uh, this question is another theme that's come up a few times. Was there a difference between salmon species in ramp scores? So the anecdote mm. chum have larger swim bladder, especially when mature, and does that affect exposure time? And this comes up a few times. Uh, there's a few questions related to that. So species specific, and then also maybe if you can tackle uh, tidal to freshwater transition and if there's changes in mortality as well. I'll start with the second question. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we actually did a, a, a large study looking at the sort of the transition zone capture and release versus fish that were much further upriver. And uh, we indeed found much higher uh, mortality rates for fish that were captured and released in the transition zone, sort of the estuarine slash lower Fraser River, where maybe it's fresh water, but still really warm and brackish. Um, compared to much further up river where the fish are much closer to the natal areas. Uh, certainly as the, what we found is the fish go further up river and I'm sure many, many of, uh, many of you experience this too, you know, they get, I, I like to call them a little more bulletproof, the further up they go as they're maturing. They're, you know, they're starting to reserve their scales somewhat. Um, so the injury effect becomes somewhat less. Uh, also the whole osmoregulation issue has been resolved. So they've already dealt with the physiological costs of doing that in the lower river. Um, but, and, and there's so much more scale loss going on in the estuary than in the upper river. So uh, yeah, we did find, and we've published on this as well. Um, this is Art Bass, one of my former PhD students, uh, found uh, you know, higher, um, higher mortality for catch and release fish in the estuary. Uh, but you know, the thing that kind of confounds a lot of these upper river, lower river comparisons often is the local environmental conditions in terms of temperature. 
And so, you know, you can still have really high uh, post-release mortality in upper, upper river environments if the temperatures are high. Uh, so, you know, you might have bulletproof fish to a degree, but they're still being driven by the same metabolic physiological processes at high temperatures. So maybe they're more resistant to dealing with, uh, you know, hardships associated with nets and, and, and gear, but uh, they're still uh, dealing with the same uh, thermal stress and that doesn't change. Uh, and so, you know, certainly we've seen in high, we've tagged in high temperature years and normal temperature years in the same locations and those high temperature years can, can kill almost all the fish that we capture and release uh, compared to normal temperature years where you have much better survival ship. So yeah, it really matters where the events occur and also matters locally what the temperature conditions are. Back to the original question about ramp. You know, that's an interesting one. We haven't really done enough experiments to know how different species are in their ramp measures, we tend to work on a few, a couple species and move to another one. We move from one environment to the other. And we've been using the ramp metric kind of universally in terms of whether a particular ramp score means a particular something universally. Certainly that we, we do see um, some element of universality with the, the, the fact that, um, and it's not so much whether they have a large swim bladder or not, it has a lot more to do with just their basic uh, swimming physiology. And, you know, Pacific salmon, uh, by and large, um, have the same metabolic processes in, in which they swim and utilize oxygen. We've done a lot of laboratory studies on swimming performance across almost every one of the species, and you, you, you find the same fundamental relationships between oxygen use and swimming speed, um, and in, in terms of when anaerobiosis kicks in. So it would be interesting to really explore that issue of whether species do differ. We've been kind of treating them as though the ramp measures are telling us somewhat similar things among species. Uh, and in some cases we've had no choice but to do that because we, we don't, we, it's like apples and oranges thing again, because we have some species where we're not doing any telemetry tracking like the chum studies in the North uh, and we don't have any laboratory studies on chum. So we kind of have to rely on other species uh, ramp measures to make sense of what's going on uh, with, with uh, the species where we don't have telemetry tracking. But we don't rely just on ramp. You know, we're also relying on some of the other blood physiology. And something that I haven't talked at all about that we're, we're also relying heavily on these days is genomic work. And so um, a lot, in a lot of our studies, um, and including the ones I've, many I've talked about here, but I haven't brought it up in this presentation, is we're collecting a really tiny, small piece of gill filament. And that gill filament can be used in, in, a, in a genomic setting to be able to look at which genes are active or non-active in the fish. And this has been um, kind of a game changer for us in terms of understanding the physiological processes associated with survival of fish. So we can look at metabolic performance, we can look at stress, we can look at disease, all through uh, the lens of, of, of genes and which genes are active and which ones are not. Uh, and certainly this is work that we're doing with the, the Coho and Chinook studies. We haven't, had, we haven't even had our analyses run yet to be able to know what they're telling us. But in studies that we've done um, you know, several years ago, we, we see that when these fish are experiencing high temperatures, that their heat shock protein genes are activated. When they're being uh, excessively handled, we see um, genes activated that are suggesting that they're suffering from cell damage. Uh, so it's been a really um, useful tool uh, but uh, I just don't go into it a lot in these presentations because I, I could spend my whole presentation talking about genomics instead of uh, you know fish migration and behavior. But again, the genomic work in the past has really supported the ramp work. And that's where I'm going with this in terms of uh, at least we know the mechanisms, we understand it at the physiological level. We're making some broad assumptions that it might be applicable among species. Uh, but, you know, as the, as the person rightly said, maybe, uh, you know, we do have to uh, consider each species somewhat differently from, from one ramp measure to the other. Okay, great. Uh, again, similar line. Has your research shown any difference in maximal effort or output by species? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to be probably blown away by what I'm about to say, but the... In the research that we've done with, and I said we've done uh, swimming performance studies on Chinook, 
coho, sockeye, and pink salmon. And we've looked at numerous populations of all of those species. First take home is that population matters as much as species. Certain species are, are, are your athletes, uh, but certain populations are your athletes. So for example, within sockeye, uh, lower Fraser sockeye populations, they're basically your couch potatoes. When you look at the swimming performance, they, they actually perform quite poorly relative to those that are from the upper Fraser. Uh, those, would I, those are the ones I would consider your elite, elite athletes of the salmon world. Similarly, when you look at upper, upper Fraser River Chinook and compare them with lower Fraser Chinook, you see the same sorts of things. Even though Chinook are thought to be really strong swimmers, lots of differences among populations within the species. But when you control or account for body size, pink salmon are your best swimmers. They, they can exhibit some of the highest swimming speeds uh, when you correct for body size, and they have some of the highest thermal tolerance of all the species. So they're, they're remarkable fish that we don't study enough. Cool. Okay. Um, do high temperatures impact juvenile, juvenile salmonids in the same way as adults? Or have you done any work around that? Yes, we have. In fact, we've sort of conducted a life cycle analysis for sockeye and we've looked at juveniles and some of the other species. And what we find is that thermal tolerance in juveniles tends to be relatively higher than for their adult counterparts. It's not universal, but that seems to be the way it is. And it might have a lot to do uh, with sort of the, the historical experience uh, or the typical experience that these life stages have to have. And so what we've found with our adult research is those, those uh, populations that have the highest thermal tolerance are those the ones that routinely experience the highest temperatures during their migration and the reverse holds as well. In juveniles, because so many of the juveniles for species that have to spend time in fresh water, they are often spending time in pretty warm fresh water. You know, uh, Chinook and Coho in the summertime, some of their streams can get quite warm, depending on where you are. Uh, sockeye in lakes, uh, if, they're, if they're spending time feeding uh, towards the epilimnian surface water of some lakes, it's quite warm. It's not surprising then that those particular uh, life stages that might exist for long periods of time in fresh water have somewhat higher thermal tolerance than perhaps the adults um, if, if those adults are migrating when temperatures are cooler. So it really comes back to what's the historical experience. So what has natural selection worked upon for that particular life stage? But in general, yeah, it seems like the juveniles have higher thermal tolerance than adults, all else being equal. Awesome. Um, are there any studies or options on the table to artificially lower river temperatures to combat climate change? Will this be needed in the foreseeable future? It's, you know, as crazy as some of you might think that sounds, that's actually been talked about. It has been uh, proposed. Uh, it's been written about. Um, and certainly we have done things on a smaller scale to achieve similar objectives. So. Up in the horsefly at McKinley Creek, they had a spawning channel where they tried to manipulate water temperature in it by pumping water in from the lake. Um, I don't believe it was terribly successful, but the idea was, in, was, was interesting to try to cool spawning grounds to co cope with what was believed to be one of the limiting factors for successful spawning, which was high temperatures. You know, to be able to do this on a regional or watershed scale is probably just not conceivable. But the point you raise is really important because it means we have to protect the cold water refuges we have. And the reason these are so important is because where we've put thermal temperature loggers into migrating salmon, and we've done this quite a bit, and we look at the data that comes from those thermal loggers when we recover the fish from a fishery or from spawning grounds, we find that uh, migrating adult salmon will select cool water wherever they can find it. And when they migrate, for example, Fraser River sockeye, they can't find cool water in the Fraser River main stem generally, but when they, they make it to their natal river system, natal lake systems, um, there's often one or two lakes they, they can migrate through and they immediately go into the deep portions of the lakes. And, and we've also studied the success of fish that choose that behavior and don't choose it. 
And those that don't choose that behavior don't survive as well to get the spawning grounds as those that do use that behavior. So we know that thermal refuges are core to the long-term survivability of migrating adult salmon. Um, how we ensure the protection of those and how we go about that is really the question. But moving water, cool water from one area to the other probably isn't feasible or viable, but certainly protecting areas and ensuring that this is on our radar is really important uh, for the viability of these fish because they do need them. They absolutely need those cold water refuges. Awesome. Uh, this is a, back to hooks again. And some of our larger inland lakes, we've gone from single barbless hooks back to treble barbless hooks to reduce brain and eye punctures, especially in smaller fish. It's been hotly debated. Uh, are you looking at treble versus single in your uh, experiments or octopus hooks or anything like that? Very good question. Um, I know others, other colleagues of mine who study these sorts of things are looking at lake fisheries and um, not in BC, but in other jurisdictions are looking at treble hooks, barb hooks and barbless hooks. We're not studying that largely because we're focusing on uh, uh, river systems. Um, the octopus hooks, hooks, yes, but not trebles. We are, we are um, you know, studying systems that generally uh, don't utilize treble hooks uh, or have choices between barbed or barbless. We're not working in those lake fisheries. That might be something we get into uh, in the future. And, and certainly this is not new research. I, I went to grad school with somebody several decades ago, ago who was studying the use of treble hooks uh, in James Bay on, on Arctic char and, and, and showing the negative consequences of that in terms of, of, uh, of bleeding associated with uh, a lot of these uh, fishes living in um, subarctic areas because they have antifreeze components in their blood, which prevents coagulation and travel hooks was a real problem. So it's really context and locale specific, I think, in terms of those, those situations. And I think it's a really important research to do, uh, particularly uh, for lake fisheries. It's just something we haven't gotten into in a big way. Great. Uh, with the DNA work done with Chinook, have you broken down age classes and survival? Is there, uh, is there any kind of relationship between age, size and mortality or survivor? Uh, we have looked at size, uh, in terms of age. I mean, we're, we're, we've been biasing, um, our capture of fish to ones that we believe are about to mature. So in, in the Chinook sense, uh, you know, probably, probably five-year-olds, um, although maybe some four-year-olds are being captured. We do have that data. We haven't really played it up. We're not seeing any relationship right now with size. Um, age is something important, but I have to tell you, I think what's even more important than age or size really is sex. And, um, you know, as I mentioned during my talk, one of the key things we found over 20 years of studying salmon is that sex matters and that, you know, female salmon are, are more susceptible to stressors than male salmon. And there's a whole bunch of physiological reasons why if they have smaller hearts, uh, higher heart rates. Um, devote a lot more energy to go and add, so less energy available to pay off auction debts. Lots of, lots of reasons why that might be the case. But um, the one thing that we can do with our, our current research with Coho and Chinook is that we, uh, fortunately, there's now uh, genetic approaches for assessing sex. So we, we rapidly now have information on sex we, and uh, so that now we can look at that in, in our results. We haven't done that yet, but we will be. Okay, that's awesome. I've, uh, we'll, we'll give it five more minutes max because I know you, you're all you're getting talked out, I'm sure. Um, this is more of a stakeholder type question and I'll just expand on a little bit. How important is, you know, sport fishing data, First Nations data, stakeholder contributions, that sort of thing, citizen science to your work and your studies? Yeah, really good question. Thank you for that. Um, we could not do our research without the involvement of several of those groups you just mentioned. It's impossible. Um, it, it's, these, these issues are just too big for an academic group like mine to uh, undertake unless we have the, uh, uh, the collaboration, both not just financial, but logistic collaboration of groups uh, across the spectrum. We, you know, we, we've had groups come to us, um, First Nation groups come to us 
fishing organizations, commercial in industries coming to us to, to help them study an issue. And, 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 and that's what we do. We, we are trying to help problem solve um, because these are things that we're interested in, but we can't do it alone. The citizen science work that we're getting into right now is really important as, uh, for our angling work because we want to be able to make the work as realistic as possible, but we want to be able to generate you know, a best practices guide after this. And we want to know how people fish and, and we want to be able to emulate that and then look at the consequences of how people do that. And I you know people aren't trying to intentionally harm fish, but if we can uh, identify ways that we can improve things based on what we know people generally are doing or what they're not doing, uh, that will really work its way into these best practices guides that we'd like to contribute to. We'd like to take the lead on and we want to get D and DFO has committed to, you know, to participate and to incorporate and, and, and be partner with. So I think it's really positive that we've got that, those links with agencies and, and uh, other groups. And I think that's what makes us so unique is that we can kind of be the honest broker in between various groups. Um, and, and I sort of, I often feel like I'm a broker when I'm come to meetings. Uh, fortunately, I, none of you are, are, I'm not in the middle of any of you here, but I hold annual meetings each year, scientific meetings where we have people that are often at odds with each other because of their of their uh, user group or stakeholder group or uh, uh, in, indigenous group. But you know, when they come to our meetings, uh, bringing people together has been the best way to not just generate uh, ideas about our research, but to generate those collaborations. And so, you know, I do this every February, standing room only, it wasn't this year, but uh, you know, it, and it's, it's a great way for us to uh, get, to make academic research relevant. So uh, I really hope that all of you are, will be able to keep helping us with that app, but also if you have ideas of research uh, for your group and, and there's ways that we can help at least provide information or expertise, uh, you know, we're, we're always excited to do that. Well, that's awesome. Uh, we're just about there. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you one final question. Uh, if there's one thing you want to stick in people's minds around salmon, generally, um, what, what would it be given the state of salmon, especially on the Fraser? What would it, what's the one take, take home? I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you want me to say something positive and uplifting as we as we leave this call. Well, I think people are here because they want to they want to do well by salmon. So I guess yep. what's you know what's the one thing that we can all jointly do, take the time to do to try to make things better. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and believe me, I think a lot about this because I'm often asked about this in my classes that I teach, and you know I've got all these young students that want to know what, and they're all very idealistic, and what can we do to help make things better. And it's a difficult question to answer right now. Uh, there's no doubt it's difficult because we have uh, a lot, you know, so many populations are getting designated as threatened and endangered, particularly in the South. You know, we, we, we look at um, how habitat issues are overtaking uh, some of our populations in certain regions. Um, you know, I, I do take comfort uh, from the fact that, uh, you know, salmon are so immensely adaptable uh, and they have shown enormous um, resilience still in the face of climate change and in the face of habitat alterations. So there's still some populations that are doing well. Uh, they're just not in the South. They tend to be more in the North. Um, so I think what I want people to take away from is that it's not doom and gloom, it's not despair, but, but we need to appreciate that things might not be the way they used to be. And I think that's an important realization. It's difficult for, for me to come to terms with that. We may not have the same run sizes we once did in the South. It's not to say that salmon are gonna disappear. It just means we have to take care of them differently and conserve them in a way uh, that may not be as consumptive possibly as we were hoping for, uh, but it doesn't mean that they can't be. Certainly chum and pink salmon often stand out as species that aren't doing as bad as others. In some cases, uh, they're doing quite well, particularly in some watersheds in the central and northern portions of their distribution. Uh, so being able to take advantage of, of fisheries and fish uh, where they're still doing well and, and understanding that, that you know, the reason pink and chum are doing better, and, and particularly pink, is because they are so adaptable. Pink salmon have a remarkable life history. Uh, they have a remarkable swimming performance and, and thermal tolerance. And they don't spend much time in fresh water, so they, uh, you know, they're not dealing with the climate change effects as much as others. So, uh, being able to kind of uh, reposition our thinking on 
on what is the new normal, I think is really important to do. Uh, but don't give up hope because you know these, these animals are amazing in terms of how they can still cope and overcome, but we do have to give them a lot more help now and a lot more understanding. That's great. Well, uh, thank you very much for taking time on a Thursday night uh, as we approach summer. I'm sure there's a lot of things you'd love to be doing outside. Uh, we really appreciate your time and preparing the presentation and uh, hope to have you back again once you get some more results from your students. Uh, there's a lot of interest on the, the catch and release work. So I'd like to thank you, all the folks at UBC. Uh, I'd like to thank Martina and Brian and Steve who are supporting us tonight. And uh, I want to give everybody a heads up. June 29th is the next uh, webinar. It's going to be Road Ecology and the Anthropocene Lessons from Banff and Beyond. That'll be with Dr. Adam Ford from UBC Okanagan. So that'll be another uh, top notch speaker and presentation. So, Dr. Hinch, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And keep doing all the great work you do. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for sticking it out. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Good night. Thanks.